Hello, everybody. Thanks for coming by. My name is Jordan Glasgow, product manager from Dolby, and I'm very happy to have Mr. Steve Jenowick here joining us today. Thanks for being here. My pleasure. Thanks. How does it feel to be back at NAMM after a couple of years? It's good. Today's the only day I'm here, so I'm not doing the whole immersive NAMM experience. <laughs> but we're going to do the immersive it's, it's, Dolby experience. Yeah, it's fun to see my friends and people not on a screen on Zoom. So. So you've done a ton of Dolby Atmos mixes. I'm just going to read off a few. Cynthia, Erivo, all of the Blue Note content, Minions 2 soundtrack, Nora Jones' deluxe version of Come Away With Me, many others. We'll talk about some of these today. But um, yeah, tell us a little bit about the Cynthia and Erivo. I think that was a recent one that you did. How'd that come about, and how did you treat the sounds? Yeah, that's it's a great record. I don't know if you guys have, have heard Cynthia know who she is. She's an actress, but she's just such a great singer. and. Um, she's signed to Universal Label, so they actually, the Universal Atmos team contacted me and said, we're going to want you to do this Cynthia Revo record in Atmos, but can, can you just do one song? They want, we want to send you a song and do that song, and then Cynthia's going to come and listen to it, but eventually we'll do the whole record, but just do the one song first. So <clears throat> they sent me the song, and I listened to it, and I was like, wow, this is, first of all, it's a great record, a great song. She's a great singer. But the record was based on all this ear candy stuff. Lots of synths and stuff that moved, it moved in stereo. And I was just like, this is amazing. And, and I said, well, are there any, anything I should know about this record? Is there you know, any, anything from the artist or the producer? I said, the only thing they said to us is just go crazy. So I did. <clears throat> and I put stuff all over the place. I had stuff moving. You know, it starts with a car driving. So that was like, oh, well, now we're driving that around in a circle. So we did that. Are you um, are you bouncing back and forth between the stereo version while you're doing that? And just always, always bouncing back and but forth. But on that, yeah. you had creative liberty to kind of go yeah. beyond the stereo. On that like. one, I, I let go of the stereo pretty quick on that, on that yeah. one. Um, and I did the one mix. And Cynthia came in one morning, really early, like 7 o'clock in the morning. And she heard it. And I watched her eyes light up. And she was like, this, is, oh my god. And she was like, can you put that line of vocal over there? And can you move that over there? And she took what I had done, what I thought was crazy, and made it even more. But it still worked. It wasn't just crazy for being crazy. And then she started playing me the rest of the record on her phone. I'm like, when you do this one, can you make it like this? And when you do this? so. So it was really fun because I had this license to just go nuts. And I had a record that lent itself to it. Not all records lend themselves to that. Sometimes it's, you know, you have to be more conservative. But that particular record really lent it to it. <laughs> Mixed the rest of the record. She came down. We actually went to, to Lemon Tree, the PMC studio, and went through the... So I mixed the record, and then she came down, and, you know, we tweaked it. And again, she was like, no, more. Put that over there. Oh, put that over there. I want that up there. I want that. She loved it. And to the point where she was like, I don't ever want anybody to hear this record in stereo. Like, unbeknownst to her, she made a record that was literally made for Dolby Atmos. Wow. <laughs> yeah. How does it translate on headphones? <laughs> Great. Yeah. I think it's because it's a very, it's a very aggressive spatial mix. It, it actually, you do feel it really well on headphones, you know, as, nice. much as, as much as you can in binaural. It's, it's a different experience in headphones. Yeah, for sure. Are you QCing on soundbars and other kind of consumer devices as well? or? I do. I have a soundbar at my house. Um, I will say I, after so many years of mixing Atmos, I don't QC on the soundbar as much as I used to. Um, in the same way, I don't QC stereo on a bunch of different, you know, I, I listen I give it the once over just to make sure it's not broken, but I don't spend a ton of time doing it. I do spend time in headphones because that's a very valid thing. Um, but most of my time is spent in speakers because I can. Yeah. Um, let's talk about some mixes that are completely different from that. Some of the Blue Note catalog stuff that you've done. Talk a little bit about how you worked with that, which obviously was a much fewer uh, number of source channels to work with and how did you spatialize that so the blue note catalog the, there was there's two things there was the the blue note catalog and then um the miles davis kind of blue album um that was actually for sony um when we got hired to do the the kind of blue it was a three track so we had to figure out how to get it into three tracks and and actually it's a thing i did i had mixed the um the Rolling Stones Rock and Roll Circus movie, which was also a three track. 
and we came up with the technique where we we took the three tracks and we made a really nice mix of it and then we pumped it into studio b at capital and i hung about a dozen microphones and studio c is right across the hall so i brought the mics into the atmos room and spread the mics around the room and balanced it till i felt like i was sitting in the room and for the Rolling Stones movie, it was great because then they added post-production to it. So we just got the music a little more ambient and surround, and then they put in applause and all that stuff. When we decided to do Miles Davis with a three-track, we said, well, let's try the same thing, only we used Studio A. And we did the same thing. We played back, you know, the great thing about that was we got to go back to the original tapes, so the fidelity is amazing. Um, and when I do the Blue Note stuff, as much as I can go back to original tapes, I do. And you know, we can't really pick it apart because it's mono or two track or three track. Um, I'm just trying to make it ambient. So I use, for Blue Note, I use Studio B. Um, Don Was and I sat, who's the president of Blue Note, and we sat for a day and we came up, you know, we tried a couple different things, reamping and move the speakers and change the mics and did this and did that. And on like five or six different albums and came up to a point where Don went, this is really cool, I really like this this is what Blue Note's going to sound like. And it was kind of, we kind of referred back to Rudy Van Gelder, who did a lot of the original Blue Note stuff. You know, Rudy had a setup he would use for Blue Note and a setup he would use for Verb and a setup he would use for Impulse. They were all a little bit different. So we decided that this is going to be the sound of Blue Note. So anytime I get a Blue Note album, that's the that's setup I use. That's my template. Granted, it, every record's different. It just changed a little bit. But that's the basic. And now I have one like when I do records for Verve, same kind of thing. I use a different studio, different template. So those, you know. So we, is it all bed or is there objects in there as well? It's all objects. It's all objects. Yeah. And then separate source and separate reverb or? <clears throat> Depends on the record. Not a lot of reverb. It's mostly just ambience room. in the room. Yeah. Um, if you listen to them, it's, it's kind of like the original record in the front. And then ambience to kind of pull you the, the idea is to make it feel like you're sitting in the room with the band so i'm not you know we don't take miles davis and make him fly in circles or anything like that um you know it, it's just it's a listening experience and for the for the jazz stuff it works really well because that's music that you're just listening to you know it's it's active listening but you just want to feel like you're immersed in it and you know the miles davis is the best example it's not a blue note record but it just it actually sucks you into it more than listening just even though it's bigger and more ambient you actually get pulled in a lot a lot more and it's really fun yeah. cool and i mean the records are so good <laughs> yeah there's that yeah. uh so you master all of your atmos tracks as well as mix them i do my own yes yeah and so you've been because there was no the... mastering engineers when i started that, yeah. that could do it yeah you've been partnering with us on the dolby atmos album assembler we're showing a preview of it over here if you haven't seen it yet, but it's a mastering tool for Atmos. You do a lot of it in Pro Tools as well. So talk about a little bit about your mastering workflow, some of the kind of pain points. What's hard to master in a DAW? How does the album assembler help? So, you know, I, I say I master my own records. I actually don't call it mastering. I call it assembling because I'm just putting this album together. Most of the records I'm doing, I have a stereo reference that I'm somewhat matching. So I'm matching levels. I'm, you know, if there's compression built into the stereo record, I'm probably doing that in the mixing process because I want it to get it as close as I can. I'm getting my proper levels, you know, hitting that minus 18. And <clears throat> so then I have to take the record if I'm doing a whole album, you know, the first four or five years, well, not four or five, but two or three years we did this, we weren't doing albums. We were doing singles and singles are easy. Yeah. Hit minus 18, send it out. <laughs> it's great. Once we started to do albums, and it was like, okay, well, wait a minute. Now we got to line this up. There's, there could be crossfade. There's all this, you know, does the binaural information travel across? And, and we, it was really difficult to do the first few albums, it, like to the point where it literally took weeks to like get it all to work. And we weren't losing metadata and we weren't losing all that. And and Dolby came up with this assembly tool that I've had for a while now in different yeah. iterations of it. I don't know and if then, we just came up with it. I think you asked well, for it. I think we, we said we it. need this. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that made life a lot easier. So once we could deal with the ADM files and not dealing with split out Pro Tools sessions and all that, um, you know, just being able to go through and still most of, most of the sonic 
stuff that I do is still done in the mixing process. To be honest with you, when I mix in stereo, it's kind of the same way. I mean, I learned from Al Schmidt. We would go to mastering and have coffee, and they would run the record, <laughs> and we'd go home. Um, so, so that's not a foreign thing to me. I never leaned on mastering engineers anyways, but I always like having them there, another ear, that kind of stuff. But now with the mastering tool, it's mostly level stuff we're doing, <clears throat> making sure that this song isn't louder than this one, and and now we can go through with the tools that Dolby can do because I didn't have a 128 channel compressor and now I kind of do. Yeah. Um, so it it made a process that literally took weeks take a day. That's great. So, and it's again, it's just gotten better and better as we you know we would you know Dolby's been great through this whole process. I gotta say, even with the renderer and everything else, you know when we first started. You know, we were using the renderer that the film guys used, which is still what we use. But it was like, well, what if we had this and this and this? And Dolby would always go, yeah, that would be a great idea. <laughs> and then the next version would come out and it's like, oh, look, they did it. <laughs> <clears throat> but but the assembly tool has has been a godsend. I mean, there were a couple records I did where there's no I would still be trying to assemble that record if I didn't have the assembly tool. How about matching the lengths of the stereo? tracks is that that's very important because yeah. the streaming services like apple will reject it if it's not the exact same length i think within a frame or something of the original um so we always have to line it up especially if if, if it's a record with cross fades and all that kind of stuff it can be really difficult um and again having binaural information go from song to song it was really really helpful and the one thing we needed in the assembly tool was can we see the original stereo mix? Like, right. it's really hard to line it up if you can't see it. We were going back and forth from Pro Tools, and and now that we have that lane where we can load the stereo mix in also and, and line it up and reference it and that kind of stuff, it's it's really great. It, it's taken years off my life. Good. <laughs> Glad to help. Uh, you mentioned binaural metadata a couple times, and maybe not everybody knows what that is. So maybe just talk about what is the binaural metadata that you're putting on each song, and how does that work? Right, so within the renderer, um, we're generating not only an Atmos mix for speakers, but we're also generating the binaural mix. And inside of the renderer, we have some basic binaural settings, off, near, mid, far. And it's basically, it's basically moving. It's not like front, back. It's basically moving stuff closer or farther away from you. Um, and it does affect everything. So we go through and... And as we're mixing, we're listening, and you know some stuff we can push farther out, other stuff we want to keep punchy and in your face. So, um, but that that metadata has to has to translate from song to song. And before we had the assembler, it was really difficult because you, in a Pro Tools session, you couldn't change the binaural information from song to song. So we had to set it up. We now have this big template where everything gets, you know. I choose my objects based on the binaural settings I want to use. Um, but yeah, binaural, it's, it's terribly important. Um, you know, people are consuming this in headphones. And as much as I really want everybody to listen to it on speakers, the reality is that people are listening on headphones. So we have to accommodate those people. Is it the one thing I always caution people people would come in and listen to stuff and they'd be like oh no you can get dolby atmos in headphones and i would go no 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 no. you get binaural in headphones <laughs> it can be really cool but it's a different experience than listening on speakers it's a completely different experience you can't ignore it you can't say it doesn't matter you also can't say it's the only thing right because it's it's very valid but it's a different experience than listening on speakers the other thing about binaural and Dolby will tell you, it's constantly changing. The way the binaural is in the technology is constantly changing. Improving. Improving, Yeah, definitely improving. But the mix doesn't change. So I'm mixing on, my speaker mix never changes, but the way it's played back in binaural could be changing literally week to week. <laughs> yeah. For the and better. It's always been for the better, I will To say. make sure everybody knows, it's one mix that he's creating, and that same ADM file is being used to generate the stereo mix, sorry, the binaural mix, and the speaker mix. Yes. So you Not only have to make mix one. yet. Not the stereo mix yet. That's Not separate. Yet. We'll see. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's talk about plugins. What what kind of secret weapon plugins are you using? 
It's a, what's your go-to on an Atmos mix? Secret weapon plug. Yeah. If you're willing to share. You know, I don't know that I have secret weapon plugins. I mean, um, when I first started mixing in Atmos, I was mixing music. You know, I was one of the first guys to mix music only. And most of the plugins that were made for immersive were post production stuff. So you could, you know, they had really great reverbs for, you know, parking garage and closet and bathroom and stuff like that. Um, so I had to make a lot of my own tools. Um, and I found ways to cascade reverbs and pre delays and all that kind of stuff. And believe it or not, I still use a lot of that stuff. Now there are, there's some great immersive reverbs and stuff out there, cinematic rooms and all that kind of stuff. I mean, we all know what they are. <coughs> um, honestly, I don't know that I have, like, I'm still waiting for this secret weapon thing. That's all right. You don't, want to, you don't want to tell us We're getting we close, I think, uh, uh, having, having some conversations I've had with people over the last year. You know, we're moving in that direction. And people are starting to pay attention and... And we're starting to get plugins that are made for immersive and working in immersive, and and um, like anything else, like the Dolby Assembler, it's it's coming. It's just going to take a minute to catch up. I yeah. mean, that is probably the most useful thing that I've come up with lately. <laughs> Glad um, to help. Yeah, um, but it's there's, I think there's going to be a big shift in the technology in this next year, yeah, for a number of reasons. But yeah. Yeah. I have a feeling my template's going to be changing dramatically within really? the next year. Yeah, as some of the as some of the companies that we use kind of expand into immersive more and more. Yeah, once we get higher track counts and Pro Tools and stuff like that. You know, all right, we'll have you back next year, and you can tell us about the new uh, it all changed, the new template. Yeah. Everything I said last year, throw it away. <laughs> what about Nora Jones? Uh, we've kind of talked about Blue Note and Cynthia, like two very different things. I'm imagining the Nora Jones project was somewhere in the middle in terms of the number of stems that you had to work with. And yeah, I, Actually, I didn't have any stems for Nora. We went back to the original tapes. Um, so that was, that was a tough one because that's a record that everybody knows. I mean, it sold 20 million copies or whatever. And so it was really like we, and it's, and it's, it's a very sparse record. It had a lot of space to it to begin with. Um, so I was really, I was really nervous about that one actually because it's so recognizable and I like, it's so good. You know, anytime you get some, anytime you have to remix an old record that's really good, it's like, well, how am I gonna do that? Like, <laughs> you know. <clears throat> um, but I got the original tapes and, you know, I, I think, it was, again, it's not a record. I think on that whole record, there's one symbol that kind of does this, like on the whole record. Um, so it wasn't one of those records where there's stuff moving and flying around and all that stuff. Um, I did introduce some movement, but it's very subtle movement. It's probably, if you look at the ADM file, you'll see objects kind of pulsating, but it's not, you don't hear it as movement. Um, so with that one, it was trying to stay as true to the original record as we could. But just spread it out a little bit and you know move some stuff around i mean there's definitely guitars in the back and stuff like that so it's not like it's a stereo mix with some reverb it's definitely an atmos mix and it's i really like it i think we were able to to really you know again put you in that space you'll did hear when i talk about atmos you hear me talk about space all the time i'm just trying to create space that's did she come in and listen to it in the studio she or? actually did not did she qc it somewhere else well i had so her a and r guy eli has been with her for he's he's her right hand and she completely trusts him and he was with me the entire time okay. for the original record and now for this deluxe this super deluxe record so we did three more there was actually the super deluxe there's actually three components to it there's the original album and then there's actually the first record they recorded because they recorded the record with a different producer oh and then it got scrapped and it was never mixed, but the whole thing got scrapped and then they did it again with a reef. <clears throat> so that in stereo, so that original record that got scrapped, Tony Maserati mixed the stereo and then we mixed the Atmos of that. And then there's a third disc that's all of the demos from all the songs. And sometimes it's just her and a piano, sometimes it's a you know a small band. So we did all of those in Atmos also. So oh, cool. Super I got to check that out. It's like 40, 50 songs, something like that. 
Yeah. Very really nice. Fun. Yeah. It, again, it's such great music. It was, you know, when you pull the songs up, you're like, oh, yeah, that's cool. I, so you, you talked know, about so space. Well produced and, yeah, it's great. Yeah. So <laughs> in, in terms of space, like, talk about loudness and Atmos and how Atmos has changed kind of the paradigm for how loud you need to make a song or a record. Yeah, you know, because of the 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 level standards for delivery, this minus eighteen luffs thing that actually Carrie and I came up with. <laughs> I didn't know it was that the one time I got to like, what's the standard? It's that okay, you know. I mean, we kind of sat at Abbey Road with a couple of guys and and you know scientifically, but decided that was the number minus eighteen. So, and then Carrie, we can't yell at him anymore for it, so you have to yell at me. Um, <laughs> But, I mean, there's reasons for it, but we have that level standard. It's, it's great because it's a standard that's over the entire course of the song. Um, one thing early on that we as the team, mostly at Capitol, had decided is we really liked the dynamics of Atmos, that we weren't worried about somebody playing this in their car or something like that. We didn't have traffic to deal with and all that other stuff. So it was okay to make the loud parts loud and the soft parts soft. And let's leave the dynamics in here. It's, you know, they're part of music. It's really, it's great. So let's leave them in. And, you know, because, and also we didn't have a 128 channel limiter that we could slam and throw it out the door. We had to work at it. So, so I think because of the technology we didn't have at the time, I think it actually helped us in that way because now we have these big dynamic mixes that are that are really fun, you know, make the chorus loud and the intro soft. It's okay. Like, um, but you do have to hit that level. I mean, you have to watch the level because if you go over the level, they're going to kick it back to you and you're going to have to do it again, yeah. which is another reason why the, again, to circle back to the, the tools that we have now, it's kind of nice to be able to talk about it now. Like, yeah, if I like, had this tool for a couple of years and we were like, how'd you do that? Oh, I don't know. I had a thing. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but now we can easily adjust the level. If one song's a little too loud, you can just pull it down a couple dB and, you know, you're pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, you're on the forums a lot, giving a lot of advice to mixers who are maybe more new to the format. What kind of advice would you give to people who are just getting started mixing in Atmos today for music or for post? I would say first thing, if you have not done hundreds of mixes in Atmos, you cannot mix just in headphones. It's not going to work. <laughs> Your mixes are going to sound weird. Every, there's, everything's going to be in the back. <laughs> um, so while you can use headphones, you know, download the software, get it, pull it up on your, you know, learn how it works, learn how to move stuff around. But if you're really going to mix seriously in Atmos, you need a speaker system. Um, also, you know, you'll hear the arguments, but everybody listens in headphones. It's like, yes, but like we talked about before, that speaker mix, that ADM file that we create is the master file, and that's not going to change. And the binaural mix, the technology that plays back the binaural mix is constantly changing. So the binaural mix isn't changing, it's just the way it plays back is changing. Um, so yeah, if you want to get in this and actually make these records, you're gonna there's some investment to it. It doesn't have to be huge, you don't need hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of speakers, but you need speakers. Um, you're not going to be able to pull it off just in headphones. Certainly not yet. Maybe as people get more familiar with the technology and all that. But yeah, you, you definitely need a speaker system. And you need to have a way to listen to, you know, same as stereo. You got to listen to other people's mixes, figure out what works, what doesn't work. Um, if you go on Apple Music, there's some really, really bad mixes out there. Like really bad mixes. So learn from them. Same for <laughs> stereo. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Uh, what about bass management? I've seen you chatting about you know how yeah. to handle the LFB or not handle the LFB. Yeah, um, it's funny. We talked about it a little bit this morning. Um, I think you, sh uh, you as a mixer should always handle the filtering of the LFB channel yourself because especially when you get into the smart speakers and the sound bars and the headphones and all that stuff, you have no idea how they're handling the LFB channel. So, for instance, when we started working with Amazon before their little Amazon speaker came out, you know, I, I said, well, what's the LFE doing? And for a while, they were rolling the whole thing in. And then for a while, it wasn't in at all. And then it was back in and then it was back out. And, and I realized very quickly, they're just taking the LFE channel and rolling it in. And the way most of us hear it, 
in our speaker systems, it's base managed either by the roll off of the subwoofer, whatever it is. But what you're actually printing is full range. So if you if you're in Pro Tools and you use that little LFE fader on the channel, you're putting a full range kick drum onto that LFE channel. And if somebody plays it back without bass management, it's going to play back at full range. So what I what I do and what everybody I you know I caution everybody is filter it yourself. Not all everything in my template. If I send something to the LFE, it goes through an aux channel that's filtered. I think my filter is sitting at about 150 now. Um, so I'm filtering it myself. Um, the other thing I will caution is it's not where all your bass goes. It's just to help the bass a little bit. I got a mix to listen to and somebody, you know, they were like, this sounds kind of funny to us. Can you QC this and see what it is? And I played it back and I was like, oh my God, like the bass, the drum, like anything with any low end was just in the subwoofer. Oh, wow. At Capitol, where we have a big system with huge subwoofers, I mean, it was, I could hear it great. It was, you know, it actually sounded somewhat okay. And as soon as I muted the subwoofer, it sounded like this. Like <laughs> there was nothing, there was literally nothing below like 300 hertz in the mix at all. The bass went away, the kick went away. So it was like, yeah, you can't do that. You know, your LFE is a little bit of extension for the bass. I'm constantly muting my LFE channel. You know, I'll, I have a switch that mutes the speak, the actual speaker. So I'm turning it on and off. If, if when I turn my LFE channel off, if all the bass in the kick drum goes away, I've, I'm leaning on it too heavy. It should just kind of fill out the room for me. If you're doing a movie and you got sound effects and explosions, go for it. Make the room shake. But, it's good advice. But manage it yourself. Don't, don't ignore it. All right. Uh, I think we have time for one more question. So I'll ask you kind of an open-ended one. Uh, what's the most interesting or uh, just unexpected thing that you've learned doing all these mixes? In this scenario, it was really fun for me because I was one of the first people to do it. So I literally got to make up my own rules. Um, you know, I would ask people early on, like when we built the room, people like, Carrie and Nate would come in and I'd be like, how do you deal with it when you have? And they'd look at me and go, ah, you're the first person that's done it, so I don't, we don't know, just make it up. So it was really fun getting to kind of make it up as I went. Um, luckily, a lot of it worked. Um, so kind of being on, the, being on the front of this has been really fun. Um, being able to help develop technologies like, you know, hey, it'd be great if we had a plugin that did this. And six months later, something, does this kind of work? You know, that's, that part of it's been really fun finding what works, what doesn't work. You know, I've told a story about I had a really weird thing with a vocal where I put the vocal in a bunch of speakers and as I walked around the room, it was really creepy because it kept following me around the room. No matter where I was, the vocal was there. And like two years later, I got sent some Marilyn Manson stuff to mix. And I was like, ooh, it'd be really creepy if you followed me around. So, so I did it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and wherever you go, Marilyn Manson just follows you around the room and it's really creepy. So. You know, something that was that was completely broken on one mix was completely perfect for another mix two years later. Right. <laughs> so, That's a good story. Yeah, it's kind of fun. Well, yeah. Well, Steve, thank you so much for coming by and talking with us. My Thanks pleasure. to all of you for being here. I hope everybody has a good show.